So, Pirate and Mithra were revealed for Smash. If you don't know me, the Xeno series is my favorite video game series of all time, and the only character I really expressly wanted for Ultimate was literally another Xeno rep, just so Shulk doesn't have to be alone and we can get representation of more than one game. Needless to say, I am very happy right now, and I'm even happier with the amount of neat little references and Easter eggs to things from Xenoblade 2 and beyond in the Pirate and Mithra trailer. So, while I'm nowhere near good enough at Smash to do a moveset analysis, I do think it's worth me doing a trailer analysis to point out and explain all of the neat little things that are here. I'm going to try and make this as friendly to newcomers to Xenoblade 2 as possible, so I am going to spoiler warning things when I have to talk about spoilers. I'm going to just say mild spoiler if it's a thing that happens relatively early in the game, or major spoiler if it's something that happens later, that sort of thing, and then put the word spoilers up on screen and take it away when the spoiler's gone so you know how long to mute for. That being said, let's get right into it, because hello Tom Fox reaction there. That's a reaction to the entire 50 minute direct. I wouldn't be surprised if this video ends up being longer than that. So before we get started, I think I do need to point out that the Nintendo Switch click, the E10 and up, and the Smash logo thing before it fades into the clouds, those were not present in the original version of the trailer that was shown in the direct. It just cut straight to this uh, after I think the, like the COVID PSA and the Nintendo Direct logo. So this confused a lot more people than it would have if it started with that. If it started with that and I saw this, oh, hold on, load please, there we go. If it did this in the direct, I would have basically after maybe two or three notes of the song and seeing the clouds been like, okay, yeah, this is a Xenoblade 2 character in Smash. But I was slightly unsure for a good 30 to 45 seconds of the trailer if this was actually like an asset reusey Xenoblade 2 sequel or more DLC. But um, first song we hear is the instrumental version of Drifting Soul. This is a Xenoblade 2 song that was not one of the three already in the game. And I'm sort of up in the air as to whether or not this will actually end up in Ultimate itself, because this only plays during the pre-splash screen part of the trailer, which all seems to have been animated in-engine from Xenoblade 2. So there's a decent chance that they just use the music to set the scene, because while Drifting Soul does play in some cutscenes where characters fight, there, there's a vocal version as well, and both are used in some battle cutscenes, it tends to be more emotional moments or like ones where you're losing, someone's about to die, something tragic's gonna happen. So I don't know if it's a very good fit for Ultimate. However, I also wouldn't be surprised if they just chose this version of the song to set the tone because Rex is depressed looking for Pyra and there's actually a more upbeat sounding remix that does make it into Ultimate because we don't actually hear any new remixes in this trailer. All of the songs in it are directly lifted from Xenoblade 2 and one of them was actually already in the game. So if you're confused, just by this screenshot, Xenoblade 2 takes place in the world of Allrest, which is one giant cloud sea, and people live on and around titans, which are gigantic life forms, that all orbit the world tree. This is the Titan of Goldmyth, and the thing hanging down from it is the Argentum Trade Guild, which is basically the first city you go to in Xenoblade 2. So here we have Rex. A lot of people thought that, oh, if a Xenoblade 2 character is getting in, it's going to be Rex. And... I expected that too. Um, Pyra and Mithra do actually use some elements from moveset ideas I theory crafted in the past, but those movesets involved Rex. So in Xenoblade 2, there are characters called Drivers and Blades. Drivers are human for some degree of human because uh, it's a bit more of a blanket term than you would usually use in a fantasy setting. So Nia there as a cat girl, she's considered human. Tora here the potato guy, is also considered human in the context of Xenoblade 2. And then Blades are a different type of life form. They are, the, they come out of things called core crystals, and they're bonded to humans who become their drivers. Rex is a bit of a special case because he didn't directly awaken Pyra from a core crystal. Uh, they bonded in a special way because Pyra is the Aegis. Uh, she is a legendary blade who is said to be extremely powerful and been the object of a war 500 years ago that sank three major titans, three countries, to the bottom of the Cloud Sea. So she's kind of revered and feared for various reasons. And a bit of the plot of the game is uh, basically trying to escape persecution, find out what really happened 500 years ago, and stuff like that, using the Aegis's power for good, that kind of thing. So the way you fight in Xenoblade 2 is you actually don't control Pyra and Mithra, which is kind of weird because they're the fighter, you would actually control Rex, which is why people thought he would be the actual playable character. 
and you control the driver and the blade stands behind them tethering power to them and basically being a driver if you're bonded to your blade it grants you superhuman abilities and special elemental techniques you, you get anime powers basically from being a driver and so you control as rex holding pyra's sword she's transmitting power to him and rex is the one who does the regular attacks and then he has some special technique called arts but those arts build up a different gauge called the special gauge and when you use a special attack that they come in different levels rex will then toss the weapon to the blade and the blade will perform a technique on their own so while rex's moves aren't directly shown in this trailer a lot of pyra and mithra's abilities are their blade specials which are the techniques they perform in xenoblade 2 so they're not just pulling a moveset out of nowhere these are moves that these characters do use in their game so this is basically just rex is depressed because pyra disappeared and um this entire trailer is completely in character they also got the voice actors for rex pyra slash mithra and shulk back there's one other character who might have been changed that i can't really tell uh, we'll get into a bit more about characters and voice actors and what that might mean when we get to the stage later on. So, um, a lot of the story of Xenoblade 2 is Rex developing a bond with Pyra and Mithra and teaching them to accept themselves for their power and that kind of thing. And Rex just genuinely wants what's best for them. So he's obviously very concerned. He's always concerned when he's separated from them throughout the, during the story because usually it's because something bad has happened. And them vanishing without a trace is obviously extremely upsetting for him so he's very in character for, to be depressed and do whatever it takes including finding his way to final destination without a smash invite in order to try and find her Ira just disappeared so he's just getting encouragement from nea uh that sword he's wearing you do get to play as rex for a little bit you get like one introductory dungeon before you actually bond to pyra and become a driver so when you play as rex without a driver he just uses that regular sword and he gets replaced by pyra's sword later on and then later on with other weapons because you can awaken other blades that's why the game has gotcha system so that's nia one of the other party members she's one of the first ones you get and one of rex's close friends then this is the house of tora who's another party member uh tora tried to awaken a blade from a core crystal but he wasn't able to because some people aren't so he still wanted to be a driver because he dreamed of being one because they're basically superheroes. So he built his own blade and that's Poppy, his own blade. Poppy is very precious, must protect. Uh, she's just powered down for now. She's okay. So he, he seemingly was working on Poppy when Rex showed up. That's basically it. Uh, now I'm going to get extremely pedantic because you can see some color bleed off of Rex's skin here. This is not a thing that happens in the base game of Xenoblade 2, but this is something that happens in the slightly upgraded version of the engine used in Torn of the Golden Country, which is the DLC campaign for Xenoblade 2. So it seems like they're just using the best engine they had access to with these models, which makes sense. They want the trailer to look as good as possible. Uh, honestly, I don't like the color bleed, although I do think Torna looks marginally better than Xenoblade 2 as a whole. Uh, if you like your animes coloring out of their lines sometimes, then you probably don't really care about that, but yeah. So now he's in the throne room of the Empire of Morardane. That is Nile, the young emperor. That's his blade, Aegeon. And that's Morag Lader, special inquisitor of the Empire, the most powerful driver and highest military official, and her blade, Brigid. They initially are antagonists who are just straight up trying to capture the Aegis because they don't want that... They are basically view Pyra as a weapon and don't want that much power just out there in the world, so they want to restrain her and make sure she doesn't act against the interests of the Empire. But moderate spoilers... Later on in the game, Morag comes to see that they're not actively trying to destroy things and they're trying to act in the good of the world. And so she comes to uh, agree with Pyra and Mithra and she does eventually uh, make up with Rex and the rest of the party and join the party as one of the party members. So it makes sense that Rex would go to her for help. So he's just basically petitioning them like, all right, you were after the Aegis, did you take her? They're like, no, no. Uh, I don't know what she's doing. We, we haven't seen her either. And you might notice that Bridget also has a fairly risque design. And hers isn't changed here. While Pyra's and Mithra's were absolutely changed for their Smash characters. Uh, Mithra's was changed for her spirit. That was actually added to Xenoblade 2 as a free DLC costume, which I think is neat. I wouldn't be surprised if Pyra's gets added as well, although it's a much subtler change, so maybe they wouldn't bother. But you'll notice that Bridget is... is she's just using a regular model. We'll see later on in the trailer... Uh, in the actual gameplay footage, when she shows up on the stage, that her model is changed. That this translucent mesh on the front of her dress was made more opaque to cover up the whole cleavage and the belly button and stuff. So 
What I'm guessing is they could get around not having to do that here because this is technically Xenoblade 2 footage. This is not actual Smash Ultimate footage, so the trailer itself doesn't have to be beholden to the same age rating. So they don't know anything. Rex is dejected. And now he's going to Zeke von Genbu, Chaotic Bringer of Chaos, also known as the Zekenator. And moderate spoiler, also known as Crown Prince Aziklaris Brunev Tantal. So this is... Uh, the background is Tantal. He clearly went to Tantal to see what was going on and check in with one of his other friends. So, Zeke is a very goofy but ultimately well-meaning and deep character. He's he's a fan-favorite character because he is absolutely comic relief and he's a bit of a doofus sometimes. But he does have his moments. Uh, he is actually a surprisingly deep and nuanced character despite the facade. But he's also funny and, and everyone likes him. Uh, that over there on the right is his blade, Pandoria. Rex went to ask them. He shows up a few times in the game. Uh, you fight him a couple times, and then he's also an ally a couple times. So, that's neat. So, they don't know anything. They they just have very exaggerated expressions in general, and the first time you see Zeke and Pandoria, they're completely mirroring each other's movements. So, this is just straight up in character for them. Fine. Everyone is very in character, even the ones who don't speak. I would also like to point out that this is Rex's voice actor with proper voice direction. Everyone who yells at Al Weaver for doing a bad job voicing Rex, which I don't even think he did a particularly bad job most of the game, uh, is missing the point because it's bad voice direction, not bad voice acting. Al Weaver is absolutely a good actor, as you can see from this trailer, and especially a lot of moments later on in Xenoblade 2. It seems that the earlier scenes were recorded earlier, so a lot of the bad stuff gets front-loaded, and uh, he basically gets better as the game goes on. Xenoblade 2 does have a Japanese voice option, so if even hearing that you're put off by the voices of Rex or any of the other characters in English, you can absolutely play it in Japanese with subtitles for free. That's a free update you can get, so don't worry about that if you're interested in the game. Then this is the ancient ship. This is the introductory dungeon I was talking about before. Uh, Rex is a salvager, so he's on a salvaging job to try and recover stuff from the ship, and that's where he meets Pyro. So he's basically just going back to where he first met her to see if she's there. So Pyro was basically asleep in that little tube thing there. And this is neat because this is a very obscure, not really, a very obtuse Xenogears reference. Xenogears being the original Xeno game from 1998 in a Smash trailer. So Pyro was originally sleeping there in the same pose as another, as a certain character is sleeping in a different tube in Xenogears. I don't want to spoil all of Xenogears, which I would need to do to fully explain that, but the posing is a reference, and believe it or not, Pyra is less naked than the Xenogears character. That's so, nice. yeah. Where have you gone? And then we just kind of hard cut to FD. I'll find you, whatever it takes. So, Cloud's going through to FD. Now, this is really weird, because... This does still seem to be in the Xenoblade 2 engine and not the Smash 1 or something pre-rendered. I mean, it is possibly pre-rendered. I mean, this whole thing is pre-rendered. It's not running off a copy of Xenoblade 2. But it seems like that this is not... It, it, this might still be using Pyro Smash model and a model of FD with the Xenoblade 2 engine. I'm not good enough technically to know for sure. But you could see even here just based on detail and her hair and the fact that she has the stockings that this is Smash Pyra and not Xenoblade 2 Pyra. So it's kind of weird how you have... Xenoblade 2 Rex, because Rex does get a new model, as you will see later on, and then Smash Pyro together. Sorry, Rex. I couldn't tell you. So I, I just like how, um, because a lot of people, uh, because Pyro's VA, Pyro Mithra's VA, uh, is somewhat plugged into the Xenoblade community. Uh, a lot of people just enjoy having her around. She did a playthrough of the game on stream, uh, and. A lot of pe people are always like, oh, hey, are, are you going to be in the game? Are you going to be in the game? And, like, immediately after this was revealed, she tweeted something like, I am so glad I could finally show this with you. It was really hard not saying it or something. So I think the fact that Pyra herself was also under NDA is hilarious. Wow. That even Rex, her partner, didn't know. I got an invitation to join Smash! So Pyra is a fire blade. She has fire powers. And blades are capable of generating their own weapons, which is why she basically just set the invitation on fire and pulled a sword out of nowhere. Um... So, yeah, Pyra blazes into battle. These poses, the Pyra and Mithra poses on the splash screens are even a reference to something, and it's not even something from the game. After Xenoblade 2 released, both Pyra and Mithra got scale figures of them. They are really nice, but they're really hard to find, so I only have one of a different character from Xenoblade 2. Uh, but the poses on the splash screens are the same poses they make in the figures, which I think is an amazing little touch. 
And then the music playing here is the main battle theme of Xenoblade 2, which is already an ultimate. And then Rex is reflecting everyone else because we weren't expecting blades with no drivers. But the way they did it, they still include a lot of neat elements from Xenoblade 2 in it, so I'm not really complaining. And also, we go here. A lot of people complain that Xenoblade 2 is bad because it has an anime art style. But I would like to uh, share the counterpoint that if it wasn't as anime, you wouldn't get as nice exaggerated reactions like this. I think the fact that the characters can emote a lot in the cutscene animation in general is really good, especially in the characters' faces and how well they show emotion. That is a strong point of Xenoblade 2, and now Xenoblade Definitive Edition, because the Wii models were not very expressive, but the Switch ones absolutely are, and it added a whole new depth to a lot of the great cutscenes from Xenoblade 1 2. 1, 2, T-O-O, -O, not 1, number 2, like, you know what I mean. So she shows up on FD here, which is where they already were. This stance is just a stance she takes in battle. She makes this exact flame in one of her idle animations in Xenoblade 2. And I believe she does it in one cutscene as well. So Pyra is uh, very upbeat and stuff like that, as you can kind of see. And then after FD, she goes to the Dragon Quest stage. Now, if you've played Dragon Quest XI... That's Big Tree. That tree is called Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil is the world tree in Norse mythology. The world tree in Xenoblade 2 is also partially based on Yggdrasil. It even has its own Jormungand. So I think that's a really a neat reference too. And also Behold the Power of the Aegis is potentially a reference to Shulk saying Behold the Power of the Monado sometimes in Xenoblade 1. Now we're also in Sky World, which, I mean, it's a world in the sky. It's another reference to Xenoblade 2, effectively. Um, so, so far, the two stages we're on are both references to specifically the setting and world of Xenoblade 2, which I think is pretty neat. Um, there is no Skyward Sword stage, but I get... Oh, no, there is a Skyward Sword stage. I forgot about Skyloft. But I guess it is kind of funny that Skyward Sword HD and Pyre and Mithra were revealed, uh, especially since Monolith Soft, the studio that develops the Xenoblade series, also did some work on Skyward Sword, as well as designing the world for Breath of the Wild, which they got that job basically because Xenoblade has really amazing vistas and world designs. I don't think there's any specific reference to her beating up Corrin and Richter here. They're just there. Then, Forest and Colosseum. I mean, the Colosseum sort of looks like Morodane. Forest might be a reference to the fact that the first big natural area you go to in Xenoblade 2 is a forest. And Xenoblade is just known for its great visuals, which, uh, great environment design and background visuals and stuff like that. The worlds in all of the Xenoblade games are fantastic. Also, Monolith Soft also worked on Pikmin 3, so maybe there's something there. I don't know. I doubt Samus is a reference to something. Maybe she's fully covered like Rex's salvager suit. I don't know. Now, Smash Flare. This is the first attack that's called out, and while basically everything else is an ability Pyra and Mithra actually have in Xenoblade 2, this one is an original attack to Smash, which I'm not too beat up about because Shulk also had a bunch of new abilities invented for him. Uh, while a lot of his actual animations were references to things from Xenoblade 1, some of them were not, and Monado Jump and Monado Smash are completely original Monado arts to Smash. So, yeah, this appears to be her F-Smash, which I can tell because Rex says it's a smash attack. I'm smart. I, I think this is the one really goofy Rex line here, because he's like, Oh man, not only are you a fire blade, but you can, like, attack with fire. I can't believe it. So, it's totally in character for him to be hyping Pyre and Mithra up like this, but I just think it's hilarious it was like, Yo, she can do fire. Which means she can attack with fire, too. Fire. Then this is a reference to a very memeable scene in Xenoblade 2. That This one just put a smile on my face when I saw it. When you first meet Zeke, who we showed before, he and Pandoria show up and they're all posturing and being extremely over the top. And you're like, ha, yes, we're the ultimate heroes. I am Zeke von Genbu, the Zekenator. Behold my blade, Pandoria! And they're all like making exaggerated movements in sync and stuff like that. No one in the party at the time is buying it. They're just like, who are these goofs? We're just going to walk past. We don't need to spend time on these guys. But partway through the scene, there's just a cute little turtle on the ground. Pyre picks it up. And he's like, hey, what are you doing, little guy? And Zeke runs up with the most amazing run animation I've ever seen, indignantly swipes the turtle back and says, and I quote, handling a man's turtle. Because that's actually his and Pandoria's pet slash mascot, Turters. So... Gower Plane being a Xenoblade stage, Greenish Squirtle, and Krom being a kind of goofy swordsman 
are all references to that, which I think is great. Uh, I actually, you know what? I have the technology uh, of things, so I'm just gonna go through there. Let's see, Zeke. Okay, Zeke is actually represented by Cloud in his spirit battle, and Bayonetta is there for Pandora. So kind of weird that they didn't use Cloud because they already used Cloud for that before, but what do I know? Then I'm going to choose to interpret Donkey Kong being here as a reference to something the Xenoblade games do, where they take a lot of inspiration for open world games. Xenoblade X, the one on the Wii U, is just straight up an open world JRPG. And one way they encourage exploration and going back to areas to find new secrets is by throwing the idea of level curves out the window. There are going to be a lot of enemies in each area that are exactly the level you're supposed to be when you first get there. And you're supposed to fight those to gain experience and get better equipped for the battle system. And those will prep you nicely for whatever the upcoming boss is. However, a lot of times they also include enemies that are ridiculously overleveled for the point in the story you're at to encourage you to try and come back later once you're higher leveled and better at the game to try and beat them. A thing that every game does is... Very early on, when you get to the first big plains area where it first opens up and shows you how great the scenery is and how open the level design is, you get to fight... There, there's a level 81 monkey enemy, giant monkey, just kind of walking around, minding its own business, and it will attack you on sight, and it will likely kill you on your first playthrough at least once. So I choose to interpret Donkey Kong as being a reference to that. Fox being here might technically be a reference to how in the same area the Xenoblade 2 monkey is, there are a lot of canid enemies that are based on foxes and wolves, but I don't know, that much might be stretching. Flame Nova is one of Pyro's specials from Xenoblade 2, as is Prominence Revolt, and Blazing End. I don't know if the Boxing Ring and K. Rule are a reference to anything, and I don't think Captain Falcon particularly is, but the big city stage is, very massive spoilers, potentially a reference to the Land of Moritha, the futuristic Earth city that lies underneath the Cloud Sea, and provides a hint of what the secret of Allrest actually is. That's genius. Much I just love Rex's optimism here. Fighters. He's just he's just a great character. So there are no then Pyro's like, oh heck, I'm struggling. Now this choice of three fighters might actually be a reference to something, believe it or not. Because you've got woman known for certain leg attacks, you got blonde guy with a bladed weapon, and you got dark haired guy with a bow. Pretty big spoilers. The characters Akos, Petroka, and Mikhail, when you first fight them, they're as drivers with their own blades, but later on, once you defeat their blades, you rematch the three of them in one fight again, where they reveal that they have blade abilities themselves, and Akos, the dark-haired one, uses a bow. Mikhail, the blonde dude, uses uh, two bladed fans, but Link using swords could potentially be a reference to that. His weapons also glow blue, and Link uses a remote bomb. And Petroka has some kicking abilities and uses a spear, which I guess the closest you could get to that is Zero Suit Samus. Maybe Byleth if you're pushing it. So, this is just, oh, Pyra's struggling. And then, she takes a hit, and... Talk about a tight spot. She transforms into Mithra. Mithra is another blade, the true form of the Aegis, and she uses the element of light and is even more powerful than Pyra. And it's that power that the entire world fears and is scared of her sometimes or wants to use that power for itself. So Pirate and Mithra treat themselves as sisters. Although they technically inhabit the same body and only one can be active at a time, they can talk to each other mentally. And once Mithra reveals herself for the first time and you get some practice using her instead of Pyra, you can swap between the two of them at will. So basically Rex has the advantage of being able to use four blades at a time when other characters can only use three. They have the same weapon class in game, so the actual arts Rex gets are the same between the two of them, but the stat bonuses they provide and their element, which is important for elemental weaknesses and stuff, are different. So, just have Mithra coming out to save her sister in a time of need, and the song that plays is You Will Recall Our Names, a variant battle theme that plays against unique monsters like the giant monkey, although he actually uses a different battle theme because there are two unique monster battle themes in ZW2, and... You will recall our name's first place in the cutscene where Mithra first comes out because she basically ends up saving the party at that point. You will recall our name's is a very good power trip song, so it playing when the true form, the powerful Aegis comes out makes sense. I'd also like to point out the myth that, as far as I can tell, remote bombs are hard light constructs that can somehow detonate in Breath of the Wild. So yes, Mithra is so fast that she was able to cut light. 
and have it split into two distinct pieces. And we got Mithra's splash screen, which is set over a backdrop of the world tree there in the background. I'm going to go back to Pyra's. Yep, Pyra's is the world tree as well. I think Mithra's might actually be the same thing, but mirrored now that I look at it. Yeah, it does actually seem to be that. This is also her figure pose. So a lot of the just general animations and the stances the characters take are references to the poses they make when in battle. This is, I believe, one of Mithra's idol animations. Pyra's idol animation was one as well. The driver is usually the one to carry the weapon, though, so they basically just took some of her Xenoblade 2 animations and remade them, but with her either holding the weapon or having it floating by her. Cutting it close, huh? And while Pyra is, like, really nice, sweet, and upbeat, Mithra, because she's the stronger one, is a lot cockier and more abrasive sometimes. She's still a great character, though. Like, Pyra and Mithra are fantastically written characters. Back to Palutena's Temple. Back to Dragon Quest stage. I guess this could be a reference to something. Again, a lot of these animations just references to Xenoblade 2. Lightning Buster is one of her Blade specials in Xenoblade 2. So is Photon Edge. So is Ray of Punishment. Chroma Dust, however, is a bit different. Because in the DLC campaign, Torn of the Golden Country, you do get to play as the Blades separately. And they have their own arts and specials, and then you can also swap to the drivers. It's, it's basically a tag team fighting game in Xenoblade form, and it's amazing. And Chroma Dust is one of the unique specials Mithra has there. It's still not one of her arts, but it is one of her specials, so that is another Xenoblade 2 attack. Foresight. Foresight, on the other hand, is a passive ability in Xenoblade 2 that is more or less the equivalent the Aegis has to Shulk's visions from the Monado. It does work slightly differently, but it does allow you to predict your enemy's movements and then counterattack and plan accordingly. In game, as opposed to visions being an integral mechanic of the battle system in Xenoblade 1, Foresight just amounts to a really big evasion buff when you have Mithra out on the field. So this does seem to be a counter like Shulk's visions, which Whoa, makes sense. You can even use then Dark Pit kind of eats it. Terry kind of eats it. Wolf kind of eats it. Right I... I can't tell what stage this is. Is this Spiral Mountain? I guess it is. So then, the gimmick is that because you can swap between Pyra and Mithra freely in Xenoblade 2, you can swap between Pyra and Mithra freely here. And I believe this transformation pose is Mithra's render pose. Yes, it certainly is. I love how she's giving Pyra the bunny ears because Mithra is absolutely cocky and abrasive sometimes and can be rude, but she definitely loves her sister. So... This is completely in character, and it's completely in character for Pyra to be fine with it. So, presumably, Pyra's transformation pose is also her render. Yes, it... Oh, wait, hold on. Go back. I forgot that she actually did it. Let's just, let's just do that. No, it's actually a different pose, huh? Okay, so only Mithra's is. That's weird. I'm guessing her render pose is from something else, or from another one of her animations. So from this, it seems like Pyra's going to be strong and Mithra's going to be fast, which is, I guess, a way to do it, because the whole point is that Pyra is the sealed form of the Aegis and Mithra is the true form. So, in gameplay in Xenoblade 2, Mithra is actually objectively better Pyra for the most part. So, obviously, they're going to have to balance that for gameplay reasons, since it seems to be a trans, since they're a transform at will fighter instead of something like. Arsene or Sephiroth's one-winged angel form. So it does make sense, but it's not accurate to the game, but I'm willing to overlook that because it makes for a better Smash character. Together, nothing can stand our way. That's just cool how they transform between each other and one of their victory screens. Rex basically does get the Chrom treatment here, so I would be very surprised if they didn't have one victory screen where he does show up. Quite respectable, aren't they? Wait, so, to clarify this, Gramps is the Titan Azurda. He's a smaller Titan who has been watching over Rex for most of his life. And basically, uh, he's a small Titan, so he can only support one house, but Rex lives on him. And since Rex is a salvager, hence the weird scuba suit looking outfit, he basically goes around finding places to dive into the Cloud Sea for stuff. And he goes to sell them in Argentum, which is where he started the trailer. So, this is Rex's house and stuff. And it looks like the stage is going to be traveling around Allrest on the back of Gramps. And presumably just Gramps basically planking is going to be the FD form. And since there's a little platform here, which is on one of the little salvaging cranes Rex uses, 
presumably Battlefield is just going to be Gramps planking with three of those platforms. So here, he's just going around the cloud scene. We see different titans in the background. So this is Gormoth. This is where Nia and Tora are from. It's a big forest area where the main inhabitant is the cat people. That's more Ardain. That's where Morag and Bridget are from. It's mostly normal humanoid-looking people. It's a more humanoid-looking titan, harkening back to the two titans, which are both humanoid in Xenoblade 1. That is the Indoline Praetorium. It's basically the Vatican, but on a dragon. Uh, the people there are tall blue people. They aren't in the trailer at all, but that's another titan. And this is Uriah. The, this is amazing because this is actually a reference to some Xenoblade 2 concept art where it's Rex and Pyra on a little grassy knoll facing the world tree with this specific titan swooping up. And if we just go to Xenoblade to cover, that... It's more or less reused for the cover of the game itself, so this is actually a reference to that using the Rex me, and this is actually also Gramps. Early on in the story, he takes on this tiny form so he can accompany you around the world, and he just lives in Rex's salvager helmet. So, it seems like this is actually the original small Gramps model from Xenoblade 2. The salvager suit's obviously different to fit me proportions, but I think this model is actually right from Xenoblade 2, which is really funny. So, technically, Azurda was in Smash as a Xenoblade 2 rep before Pyrite and Mithra. This is just other characters from Xenoblade 2 showing up. It's Driver and Blade pairs. These seem to be lower poly, lower res texture versions of their models from Xenoblade 2. Sort of similar to how a lot of the background students from Three Houses look in Byleth stage. So, if you were ever wondering... Okay, Xenoblade 1 released on the Wii, but Xenoblade 2 released on the Switch, where the graphics were much better. So, if Xenoblade 1 released for the Wii, what would the characters look like? This may be an example. So you just got a lot of the characters from before. Nia and Dromark, Tora and Poppy. Very unanimated and dead-eyed looking Zeke and Pandoria. Morag and Bridget. You could see here how Bridget's dress was made more opaque here. I'm assuming... Go back to the spirit list. A lot of the drivers are spirits, but only Pyra, Mithra, and Poppy are spirits for the blade. So I'm guessing we get a lot more blade spirits alongside the DLC. And I'm guessing Bridget is going to be changed to have this outfit, which makes sense. But uh, other than that, I'm pretty sure most of these animations are taken directly from Xenoblade 2 or re referencing things from them. just fighting some other JRPG characters, and there you can see Argentum in the background as well. So then for their final smash, Rex does actually show up, and this is, uh, there's a lot of things that you can unpack with this, and that's because your final smashes are the level 4 specials of Pirate and Mithra. Now, I talked about how there's the regular attacks, there's the arts, and then there's the specials where the blade gets the weapon instead of the driver. Well, there are three different levels of special, 1, 2, and 3. Pirate and Mithra's 1, 2, and 3 specials are some of their moves that we've already seen in the trailer. However, there's also a level 4 special. If we page back a little bit to here, you see Mithra has her hands out and she's shooting a little golden stream of energy into Rex. Well, there's in a thing called Affinity, which is basically how well the Driver and Blade are fighting together, and that's represented by a tether of the power the Blade is transmitting to the Driver. When that turns gold, you are at max affinity. If you're at max affinity and you have your level 3 special charged up and stay close enough to your blade, you will then charge up the level 4 special, special, which is supposed to be, but not always, the most powerful attack that driver blade pair can use. And it's a combo attack between the driver and blade being their most powerful technique. They're fighting completely in sync. So it makes sense that they pull out Rex for this. <laughs> There is one other option that could have been Pirate and Mithra's Final Smash, but it would have been a massive spoiler, so I'm kind of glad they did this. Sacred Arrow. So, Sacred Arrow is Mithra's level 4 special. That's where she calls on a giant mech she's just kind of got hanging out in the upper atmosphere to shoot down. This is the exact same... Uh, it's re-recorded, it seems, but it's the same quote when you use it in Xenoblade 2. And then Rex and Pyra have Burning Sword, which is basically just a big fire attack. The funny thing is, in Xenoblade 2 itself... Their cries of Burning Sword are actually out of sync, so either they re-recorded it or they used the original ones, but put them more in sync here for Smash, which I think is funny. So, uh, Poppy is adorable. So, again, 
look at this. He's just happy to be here, and he's happy to see the Aegis there. How could you hate this boy? He, he is a ray of sunshine. And also, the fist-pumping thing is sort of a reference to one of the moves Rex does, because obviously when you have the blade holding the weapon when you're using a special, the driver can't fight or anything, so they usually just do a stock animation where they're cheering on their blade, and while the, this isn't directly the one from Xenoblade 2, Rex, one of Rex's is just pumping his fists. Ow. And this is weird because Rex showed up here. This, this is clearly a taunt, not part of the final smash. So again, it, it's more like Morgana in this case, where he does show up for one of the taunts as well. And this, this is a new Rex model. He's, his arms are bigger than they are in Xenoblade 2, and a few other things are different. His face is a little changed as well. So that makes sense that since Rex is the only Xenoblade 2 character who'll actually show up in the fighter's move set and is going to be present on more than just the Xenoblade 2 stage that he would get a new model. And also to better fit in with the slight art change that Pyro and Mithra have for Smash. So there's that. And I'm assuming that this is just a taunt where they say witness our power and because it's Pyra saying it, not Mithra, you automatically swap to Pyra for the duration of that taunt unless you cancel out of it. Which is the only explanation I really have. Unless unless Pyro was out and they taunt cancelled the transformation back into Mithra, that's also possible. I wouldn't be surprised if Pyro and Mithra have separate taunts besides the Rex one. Or if they have even separate Rex taunts, just, you know, because they're counted as two separate characters. So there's that. And then this is an amazing piece of fan service. Because they're back on Gower playing the Xenoblade 1 stage. They've got Shulk, the Xenoblade 1 character, who... Let's be real. Shulk and Ultimate doesn't look great. Like, you got this shot of Rex and Mithra looking amazing, basically just like they do in the game, if not better. And then Shulk, this is not, this is not what Shulk looks like. We'll just, just do Shulk, Shulk Xenoblade. And, because this is what he looked like in his trailer for Smash 4. Uh, this is his 2D art from Xenoblade 2, 2D art from Xenoblade 1. This is what he looked like in Xenoblade 2. It's kind of low resolution, unfortunately. This is what he looks like in Smash. This is what he's supposed to look like in Smash. And like, you know, I'm not sure where this is going to take me. Okay, it took me a sub to Reddit. That's fine. This is what he looks like in Xenoblade Definitive Edition, which like, it looks fine. Does not, does not look that good here. Does not look as good as the Smash render here either. So just in this, just, just in this little scene, Shulk looks way better than he usually does in Smash, which is slightly disappointing that they didn't make his actual model better, but who knows. Anyway, to see you two again. Shulk recognizes Pyra and Mithra. Also, this is brand new dialogue from Shulk's voice actor. Out of every character in this trailer who's voiced, Gramps is the only one that I'm not 100% sure it is actually the original VA. So I'll, I'll get to that when I think of, uh, when you get to potential Easter eggs. So, Xenoblade 1 and 2 aren't directly connected. 2 isn't a sequel to 1. However... Shulk does actually meet Pyra and Mithra through the Xenoblade 2 DLC. There's a challenge battle mode where you can do some special challenges, and in those challenges, you can actually earn Shulk and Fiora from Xenoblade 1, as well as Elma from Xenoblade X, as blades that you can equip to most of your party members and fight alongside with in Xenoblade 2. So Shulk actually meets Pyra and Mithra, and he actually has some really interesting post-battle dialogue with Mithra that has a bunch of cool lore implications I'm not going to get into. So they're actually referencing the completely non-canon to both 1 and 2, because it doesn't make sense at all story-wise, DLC mode of Xenoblade 2 in a Smash game that two characters who were in that DLC both happened to be in, which I think is amazing. So... That's just all neat and stuff. I just think this is a really great character moment for people who like both Xenoblade games. And, the pose Shulk makes here, you might know, you might remember, as the pose Shulk makes when he first gets serious in his original reveal trailer, which is also, I believe, the pose he makes when you activate Minato Smash in any Smash game, too. Which, cool. So then, she turns into Pyra for one specific reason, and that's to make this little crossing swords thing. Now this is really cool for one reason. Pyra's crossing swords with the Monado. Somewhat spoilers, although this was revealed in official trailers for the Torna DLC. In Torna the Golden Country, you fight against Malos, the other Aegis, and his Aegis sword resembles Shulk's Monado a lot more than Pyra's sword does. And 
there's actually a flashback scene to the war that never... It, the exact fighting choreography doesn't take place in Torna at all, but there is a flashback scene in Xenoblade 2 of Mithra and Malos fighting, and they do this exact same thing with Malos' Monado-looking sword and Mithra's Aegis sword. So it's really cool that both Aegises get to get a crack at a Monado. I love it. Then that cuts to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate cross Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which is really neat, and I love it all. But if we go back to the Gramp stage, there are already new Pyro lines, Mithra lines, Rex lines, and Gr Gramps lines, and Shulk lines in the game. We know that Rex does appear at least as part of the final smash and taunt, and likely as part of the victory screen. I would not be surprised if Pyra and Mithra is a fighter to get some sort of conversation with characters when on their home stage. So you do something, and for certain fighters, or maybe even all of them, you get some special dialogue of Pyra and Mithra talking to Rex and Gramps, and that some stuff happens. And my guess would be, if they recorded a couple new Shulk lines, that if that is actually a thing, and there's a codec-type conversation here, then Shulk is going to butt in on his own thing, or maybe even show up in some other fighters. I don't know. So, there's that. And unfortunately, when you go to the Smash website... Pyra and Mithra's renders aren't updated yet, so I'm guessing that they're either going to be some big spoiler for Xenoblade 2, or there's a lot of neat references packed in them in order uh, that Sakura is going to go over in depth in the presentation for them. Shulk's outfits are for the most part referencing other party members from Xenoblade 1, so I would guess that some of Pyra and Mithra's outfits are going to reference party members from Xenoblade 2. Probably not Rex, maybe Rex in another blade, but I'm guessing there's absolutely going to be a Nia and Dromark one, a Tora and Poppy one, and so forth. Now, Xenoblade 2 has less party members than one, if you don't count all the optional blades, so I'm guessing they're just going to represent each party member and their main blade that you get as part of the story. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's also referencing uh, things like Malos and Jin, some villainous characters, or even things from other Xeno games like a Cosmos and Telos from Xeno Saga, because they also show up as blades in Xenoblade 2, and stuff like that. And also, unfortunately, if we go to the stages, we've just got this. We've got coming soon. There's not even a thumbnail or a name for the stage, but I'm guessing it's going to be called either All Rest or Cloud Sea. And then also we've got this nice little mint green that's sort of the same color as their core crystal on both the series icon and the little background shot of the stage there. If you know, you know. And then I'm just going to go through the spirits list because I want to talk about new spirits. Several characters that are or at least arms, I think. Some old arm spirits did show up on the DLC spirit board. But as for Xenoblade 2, we've got five drivers and three blades. So I'm guessing we're going to get Dromark, Bridget, and Pandoria. So we're going to get blades to go with these drivers. And based on precedent, we're likely to get a uh, 10 to 12 DLC board spirit battles. So that's like four or five just from these blades. I'm guessing we're going to get some villains from Xenoblade 2. Like again, Jin and Malos are almost certainly shoo-ins. Jin looks basically like Sephiroth because he was designed by Tetsuya Nomura. And then we're probably going to get a couple characters from Torn of the Golden Country. So I wouldn't be surprised if Laura shows up there or actually if Laura and Jin, who are the main protagonists of Torn of the Golden Country as a driver blade pair, actually show up as a pair spirit. And I also wouldn't be surprised if we got maybe one or two characters from Xenoblade Future Connected, which is an epilogue for Xenoblade 1 that was released with Definitive Edition. And I kind of hope we get a couple more X characters. I also definitely hope that there is a Cosmo spirit just to get that slight, slight bit of Xenosaga representation if possible. But yeah, as for music, I'm guessing we're going to get maybe only one or two remixes. Xenoblade 1 only has part of a medley for its remix, so not a whole lot of interesting stuff there. So I'm not super confident. I would love for some Xenoblade X music, but that might be really hard because Xenoblade 1 and 2 stuff is already owned by, I think, a corporate entity as opposed to Monolith Soft, the developers of the game, or Nintendo, or like the people who actually composed them. So X's, which was composed by Hiroyuki Sawano and officially distributed by Sony, that might just be too much to ask for, but all Xenoblade music is great, so I'm not complaining about not 
X music too much, although I would have loved some uncontrollable. So, I think that might actually be it. I am going to just interrupt my own outro here to bring you an even longer outro because there are actually a couple things I forgot to mention in the video itself. The first is one other piece of media related to the character reveal, and that is this art replacing the usual character poster, which was drawn by Masasuku Saito, the main character artist of Xenoblade 2, and the person who initially designed Pirate and Mithra. By main character artist, I mean he designed most of the heroic characters, like he also designed people like Rex and Nia, while a lot of the main villains were designed by Tetsuya Nomura, who already has characters he made, Cloud and Sephiroth, in the game, and a lot of other Blade characters were designed by a bunch of different random artists. So we get to see a few characters that we've never really seen in his style before. The big one is Shulk, because we've seen other interpretations of Shulk in various art styles, but we've never really seen him in the same style as Pyra and Mithra. And the other characters, some of them are references, some of them are not. We've got even more emphasis being placed on the Gaur Plane stage, which I get that they're emphasizing the connection between Xenoblade 1 and 2, and they're like having Shulk acknowledge that he met Pyra and Mithra before and all that, and I like how that's neat, but I do think it's weird how they're on Shulk's stage and not the stage of the newcomers, but if that's for artistic choice or to fit that many characters in, I understand. Now, as for the non-Xenoblade people present, Bowser is the one who definitely has the most tying him here, because back in Shulk's reveal trailer, the first fighter to be shown jobbing to the newcomer to show off how cool he is, is Bowser, and the beginning of the trailer took place on the Gower Plains stage, so it does make sense for him to be there. As for Inkling, I'm guessing that might also be a reference to the fact that Monolith Soft has a sub-team that assists with the development of the Splatoon and Animal Crossing franchises, because the Nintendo team that makes those are made of largely the same people, so the same Monolith team helps them. Kirby... I'm not really sure. I think he might just be there because of Sakurai bias. He has gone on record to state that he likes Xenoblade 2, so that might just be there because there has to be some Sakurai character every time. And while Pichu and Mario might be there just to have bigger name gaming icons there, although let's be real, Splatoon's big enough where Inkling alone could sell something, it might also be the fact that Mario wears primarily red and has fire powers, and Pichu is primarily yellow and has lightning powers, and while, yes, in Xenoblade 2, electricity and light are considered two separate elements, Mithra has a couple attacks called lightning, and I'm not about to be that pedantic as to complain about that. So that's cool, but the other thing I wanted to talk about is potential me costumes. If you remember, Rex and Nia already have me outfits in the game. Xenoblade 2 has a sword fighter and a brawler. So my guess would be that we're not going to get any more than two Xenoblade 2 characters as me costumes, and if that, we're probably going to get a gunner. I'm guessing that they would either want to do a Malos as a villain Xenoblade character spirit, or something like that, maybe someone like Morag or Zeke. The issue is, there are a lot of Xenoblade 2 characters with more unique weapons than sword, punch, or gun, so things are kind of in the air there. One thing I absolutely would love to see would be Elma from Xenoblade X, yet again. X is criminally underrepresented, it's even less represented than 2 was prior to the Pyramithra reveal, and I think Elma would be a great addition as a Mii fighter, especially because a lot of dedicated X fans would have preferred her to be the actual Smash fighter. If you're worried that she might not fit in as a sword fighter, she wears red and primarily fights with dual swords, and there was in fact a Lloyd Irving costume in Smash 4, so, I mean, she's gonna be fine. But speaking of Bandai Namco-owned series, I really, really want a Cosmos Me Gunner outfit, just because, well, Xenosaga is good, and Cosmos already appeared as a cameo guest character in Xenoblade 2, so if they really didn't want to make you remember that Xenosaga exists, they could still list her as a Xenosaga character, or as a Xenoblade 2 character. However, it is worth noting that even within Xenoblade 2, the designs of Cosmos as well as Telos were credited as being courtesy of Bandai Namco, so they did need their approval to use them in Xenoblade 2, even though Monolith Soft also worked on the Xenosaga series, so it would be some third-party arrangement in order to include her, regardless of what game she specifically represents. As for other Monolith Soft characters, the issue with that is that while they do have a large library of games under their belt, besides Xenoblade, the only ones that really get popular are ones where they helped Nintendo out and as such already have representation. Just in the Switch's lifespan, Monolith teams have worked on Pikmin 3, which got the deluxe port, so I'm counting it, Breath of the Wild, 
Splatoon, and Animal Crossing, and those are already fairly well represented in Ultimate, so I wouldn't be surprised if they go for some other first-party Nintendo titles, or even more off-the-wall third-party picks like maybe something to closer represent the Monster Hunter Rise Hunter, which I know a lot of people would be disappointed, and I think is really weird that Monster Hunter got a boss but not a fighter, but something like that not necessarily directly tied to the idea of Xenoblade or JRPGs, just because there's already a decent amount of Xenoblade 2 representation in the Mii costumes, and they might not want to work out third-party deals to get someone from Xenosaga or even someone like Fei Fong Wong who'd be a perfect brawler costume from Xenogears, and they just don't want to deal with that kind of thing or promote any really lesser-known Monolith Soft titles, especially because a lot of Monolith's other popular games are licensed games or even more copyrighted tangled crossovers between three different publishers with almost as many characters as Smash themselves. So, that's all I got. I hope I could convince you to give Xenoblade 2 a try if you've never considered that yet and still watch this video to the end anyway. If you are a Xenoblade fan and have not subscribed to my channel yet, I would highly recommend you do so because that's basically all I talk about here. And in case I see you again, until next time, this is Luxon, signing off.